It seems like everyone is looking for a shortcut. They want someone just to tell them, buy Bitcoin or stay away from Bitcoin. And that's like so frustrating on my part. You know, investing is a high value skill that requires a lot of independent thinking and independent thought. And you're the only person who's going to be responsible for your investment decisions. So rather than listening to some you know, Joe Schmo on YouTube or somewhere else telling you to buy or sell or whatever, uh, Bitcoin or any stock or any investment, my suggestion is that you actually go deep into establishing a framework of how to evaluate something like a Bitcoin and coming up with independent thought and analysis. In this video, I'm going to share a simple framework on how you can evaluate Bitcoin and include if it's a good investment or not. Now, in this video, I'm not going to give a whole spiel on my every thought behind Bitcoin because I think Bitcoin is quite complex and I can go off on hours and hours on Bitcoin and the pluses and minuses and the complexities and the technology behind Bitcoin. But today I just want to give a primer, a simple type of beginning step to establish a framework on how to look at Bitcoin. So this framework to evaluate Bitcoin is basically to establish how things are evaluated. And I'm just going to give two type of angles or approaches on how to evaluate something like Bitcoin or a company. Uh, one thing is you can establish value or valuation through kind of value by popularity. And then the second way is to establish value by monetary kind of return of capital or dividends. Now I'm going to explain these two approaches to valuation and then we're going to try to apply that to Bitcoin to, to establish a framework on how we can establish some valuation. So first, let's look at value by popularity. Now this is just something that I'm coining right here. It's just, you know, the more something has popularity, oftentimes it gains value. For example, if you think about baseball cards, you know, I used to be an avid baseball card collector when I was a young kid. and if you think about a baseball card in itself, it has no intrinsic value, meaning it doesn't generate any value just sitting there. It's just, it's just a, a piece of paper, you know? It's not printing money, it's not building new things, you know? Um, it's not a company, it's just a piece of paper. And because of that, the value of that baseball card is solely dependent on how popular and how big the demand for that card is. And oftentimes, the scarcer the card is, and also, you know, Basically, the higher the demand for that baseball card, usually it has to be like a rookie card of a major, major star, right? That's going to drive the price higher. But this value is completely dependent on popularity. But here's the thing. Value by popularity might sound like a negative thing, but it's not completely a negative thing. Let's take a look at artwork, for example. If you take a look at artwork, artwork is another, you know, value by popularity thing. There's no intrinsic value in art per se. You know, the art piece doesn't create, you know, monetary type of cash flow or anything. But an art piece in a way is something where people feel like they want to own a piece of history, right? And there's something where the popularity of wanting to own, right, art from a famous artist drives up the price of art because of scarcity. And that establishes kind of what I'm calling value by popularity. Now, for example, if an artist, let's say after they pass away, they're found out to be like a fraud, let's say, you know, complete fraud, the value of that art piece or those art pieces are going to completely tank because now the popularity of the artist will completely tank, right? And so because of that art piece is completely valued 100% on the value by popularity kind of angle, it all depends on whether the artist is popular or not. That will determine the value of the art piece. Now, this is actually um, interesting because over the history of the world, art actually has a precedent of being a stable type of asset. You know, people throughout history, rich people tend to give large sums of money to own pieces of art from the famous artists of history. And so, I'm not going to criticize per se value by popularity as being, you know, insignificant or worthless, but I do want to contrast it to another form of valuation and that is value by dividend or value by money returned. And this is what we'll call intrinsic value. And what I mean by this is 
this value is the, the asset in its, of itself is creating value. So it's not like an art piece or a baseball card. Rather, it's like a company that's creating, selling things for a profit and creating value and cash. And this company is giving back that cash to shareholders or sometime in the future, whether it's near term or distant future, has plans to give back that cash to shareholders, right? And so that value that this company is creating eventually is supposed to go back to the shareholders in the forms of in form of a dividend. Now, this is the intrinsic value or kind of the, the money, the capital returned right, on an asset value of, of a company or a product, etc. Now let's contrast these two and compare these two models and compare that to Bitcoin. Like what is Bitcoin exactly? How can we evaluate it? If you look at Bitcoin kind of like as a value by popularity proposition, this is something that um, I want to kind of bring light to and bring some of my skepticism to. So a lot of people call Bitcoin as a store of value, right? That's the proposition that some people attribute Bitcoin's value to. They say, oh, people need a place to store their wealth and therefore Bitcoin has a certain value. But this approach to value, valuing Bitcoin is largely based upon a value by popularity evaluation approach, meaning as long as Bitcoin remains popular, it's going to hold up a certain price of the asset. But when Bitcoin becomes basically, let's say, unpopular, let's say there's a big percentage of the whales, which are basically the, the top holders of Bitcoins, Let's say they move their assets from Bitcoin to another, you know, something. When that happens, or if that happens, and the popularity of Bitcoin basically decreases rapidly, what's going to happen is the value of Bitcoin decreases rapidly because if you're buying into a, a store value kind of um, valuation approach, all of a sudden when Bitcoin loses its popularity, it no longer becomes as an attractive store of value because the scarcity basically isn't as scarce because people don't want it as much. And so I would be kind of careful if your whole thesis of investing in Bitcoin is completely on a store of value approach. I also personally think there are a lot more compelling um, stores of value, like for example, real estate. Um, that's, in my opinion, a much more compelling store of value. And even like gold, you know, I would imagine, in my opinion, I, I can make a whole video on this, why I think gold would probably be a better store of value than, than Bitcoin. Bitcoin, in a lot of sense, people take as a speculative asset, you know? It's something that they think will increase in value because of scarcity, and they're bullish on that. And they think that the popularity is going to rise in the future. And that could be the case, right? It could be the case that, hey, Bitcoin becomes more popular, the asset price goes up, but there's also the possibility of the other way happening, which is Bitcoin loses its popularity, and as a result, the price goes down. Now, what makes Bitcoin a little bit more complicated than this is that there is a side of Bitcoin that you can argue an intrinsic value for Bitcoin. Now, let me try to explain this. And in order to explain this, you have to understand the bull case for, for Bitcoin. You know, a lot of people, they, don't, they hear about Bitcoin and they hear the, the hoopla and all the rah-rah, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, but they don't really understand what the bull case behind Bitcoin is and why the ultra bulls are so excited about Bitcoin. So here it is in a nutshell. See, Bitcoin, and let's take a step back, cryptocurrency in general, is an amazing way to allow secure digital transactions from one point to any place in the world at a very just nominal cost, if, you know, if any cost. And what this is allowing and will allow in the future is basically um, a mass proliferation of digital transactions that w that's not possible in our current system of payments. Now, a lot of um, Bitcoin kind of bulls will say that, you know, with transaction costs and fees, let's say going to almost near zero cost, you're going to see a proliferation, an exponential increase in the number of digital or payment transactions that have happened around the world. And I actually buy into that whole thesis because if you think about it, you know, credit card transactions are extremely pricey in today's world. You know, you're looking at two or 3% of the total cost and that's completely ridiculous, right? Why should credit card transactions be two to 3%? A large part of it is, is security and fraud, right? And that's what the cryptocurrency um, coins are, are solving basically is that security and fraud, fraud issue.
And because it's solved in a, in, a, in a novel way that isn't expensive, the cryptocurrencies can basically undercut any digital transaction you know, platform out there currently with super, super low nominal fees. And the result of that is going to be, and I believe actually that it's true, we're going to see this increase in transactions of, of digital transactions that exponentially just ramp over the next few to several five to 10 years. You know, I don't think it's a far-fetched kind of um, assertion to imagine that the number of transactions, digital transactions, money changing hands, could actually be 100 times or even a thousand times or greater in terms of number of transactions in 10, within 10 years or so. And the reason is, is because of this. Imagine if you could make a transaction for five cents and it would cost like almost nothing. You know, imagine how many more transactions there would be out there, you know, money changing hands. Or for example, let's say you could spend one cent to read an article, you know, and it was like almost no cost to either side. This would just spawn a whole new way of just my, super, super micro payments across the internet for, you know, for almost anything and everything. And when you think about just this 100 times, 1,000 times the number of transactions, you know, that we're likely going to see over the next five to 10 years happen digitally, especially if the transaction fees are negligible or even close to zero. What you see is you see a massive transformation of the entire financial system coming. And the lucrative part and what gets the bulls excited about this is the holder, the network or the system that processes all those transactions can take a small cut, but because it's the number and the volume of transactions is so great, the amount of money that this system will basically be entrusted with, and they can just take a small percent too, is just tremendous. This is perhaps, according to the bull case, could be the most valuable system in the entire world because basically just take point you know, 1% or 0.01% of every transaction that not just current transaction today, but let's say times it by a thousand, right? In five or 10 years of the number of transactions. And you're gonna see just immense amount of value that this network creates and can extract from the world global system. And so that's kind of like the, the bull case for cryptocurrencies is that there's gonna be an entire new financial system and systems that are incarnated or birthed in the next you know, several years. That's gonna basically take this crazy amount of transactions, 100, 1,000 times, whatever current day transactions, stick it with, um, in a digital system with little, little to no friction and little to no costs. And the holder of that system just needs to take a tiny fraction of value and it could possibly be the most valuable company or system in the entire world. Now, there are pros and cons to this, but let's look at how to evaluate this. So this is an interesting valuation, interesting thesis, because if you take this example, it basically means that actually Bitcoin does or should have intrinsic value in the future, meaning it's not just a store of value, but rather it's something that can have intrinsic value as a payment system. Now also it can be more complicated than that because you can build stuff on top of Bitcoin, you know, that could act as a transaction layer, like a stable coin, which is basically a coin that's tethered to like a, a government fiat currency, which could allow for a, a plethora of transactions, but it could be tied to Bitcoin. And in a sense, also it can give stability to Bitcoin. And so in any case, what we're talking about cryptocurrency in general is that there is a use case, right? There's of intrinsic value where you, it creates a payment, a digital payment system that basically is encompassing a hundred or a thousand times the amount of transactions that happens today and an immense amount of value. Now, in order for this to work and be profitable, it could even work with just 10% of the global future digital transactions. If you know, the amount of transactions really does go up a hundred or thousand times within 10 years. And so even the bull case of Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies, it's like, what if it takes 10 or 20% of global transactions within 10 years? Or what if it takes even 30 or 40% or 50%? Like that's an immense amount of global transactions, trillions and trillions of dollars, you know, that you only need to take a tiny percent to, to, to accrue value. 
So the intrinsic value approach is basically when you evaluate Bitcoin, you're looking at the future potential kind of cash flows or you know, dividends or capital type of generated from the entire financial system that Bitcoin is a part of. And that could be actually very appealing. Now, the whole thing about this, it's, it's not a clear either or because in some ways, in order to have that future intrinsic value, Bitcoin needs to keep up its popularity and keep up its adoption in order to have any intrinsic value or have any worth as a financial system in the future. Now, this isn't the case for certain other kind of companies. For example, let's take a company that, let's say, isn't very popular and the stock isn't, let's say, hypothetically priced very high, but let's say it gives a great dividend and it's been given a great dividend for the past 10 years and it looks like it's going to be given a great dividend for the next 10 years, like this company by itself has intrinsic value, meaning it's very clear actually that it has present intrinsic value. And it's not completely related to the popularity, whether people like the company or buy a stock or not, it's still gonna give its dividend. Now with Bitcoin, it's not necessarily like that because the intrinsic value is so far in the future and so dependent on adoption and popularity. There's kind of like this hybrid approach of Bitcoin. You know, people need to pay and keep up and be and keep Bitcoin popular and adopt it for it to have a chance to have any future intrinsic value. Now I talked about kind of the Bitcoin bull case, right? Of establishing this digital financial transaction system that's immense and just crazy to think about. But there's also downside risks to Bitcoin and other, other cryptocurrencies. And the, one example is the, the tr technology in itself is not necessarily completely exclusive just to one coin. You know, oftentimes you can have just a handful of engineers come up with an entire new coin. And so it's not like you need like a thousand of the smartest engineers to draft a cryptocurrency system. It's actually the technology is out there and it's been shared enough where you can have two or three really smart people and they can come up with a coin. And so because of that, there's always risk of coins being disrupted by new coins or novel technologies or next generation of cryptocurrency technologies kind of disrupting the older generations of cryptocurrency. So this is definitely something to look out for. Another potential downside risk to Bitcoin is I think the advent of government cryptocurrency coins. Now, I actually think that um, governments will adopt cryptocurrencies because as the technology becomes more prevalent, it's just going to be easier and easier to, to adopt cryptocurrency on a national level. And there are a lot of benefits in terms of security and clamping down on tax evasion and increasing tax revenue for the government. Now, I not a proponent of the privacy kind of risks that I believe gov a government instituted cryptocurrency will will incur. But I think that over time, the government will feel like they have no choice but to roll out their own cryptocurrencies. Now, the big question I think is when the US and when you when the European Union and China and other companies roll out their cryptocurrencies, like what's the relationship going to be with these national cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin? Now, Bitcoin bulls will tell you, oh yeah, you know, Bitcoin will always be on top and it'll be a way where, you know, it can kind of go over the governments. But if you look at history, governments always find a way to kind of suppress um, things that try to subvert it. And in a sense, in our human kind of system, governments are at the top of the hierarchy of authority. And the governments tend to own the financial system and tend to regulate the financial system, especially because it's existential to the existence of the government. The government needs tax money or it can't exist. And so to that extent, I think the most logical kind of conclusion or scenario is going to be the government will clamp down on cryptocurrencies, will regulate cryptocurrencies, will be able to kind of see and record all the transactions, where they're going, who it's from, and so you won't have kind of the opaqueness that current cryptocurrencies have, which will lower the appeal in terms of advocates of privacy, et cetera, and those types of uses of Bitcoin. But overall, we're gonna see this massive increase in just digital transactions and low cost and low friction. Still within this scenario of the government clamping down on cryptocurrencies, the question still lies and looms, what percent can a Bitcoin type of cryptocurrency still hold in terms of number of transactions and volume of transactions when there exists government 
kind of cryptocurrencies as well. Will the governments completely clamp down, clamp down and just you know outlaw them, or will they find a way to coexist, where certain cryptocurrency markets will coexist with government fiat cryptocurrencies, which could be a likely scenario as well. And so in either case, it's um, yeah, there are different I guess possibilities of you know the challenges ahead for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And those are definitely risks to assess and to consider. Another risk to consider with Bitcoin is because the current value is, is a lot of it is established on this concept of store value and basically value by popularity, there's always a chance that these big holders of Bitcoin, some of the ones that are holding billions of dollars of Bitcoin can, can suddenly and silently just kind of like move their assets out of Bitcoin into something else. And that's always a concern with something that's highly kind of, um, which value, that's always a concern with something that has a value by popularity. And that's something that every person who has Bitcoin invested in Bitcoin should consider. Now you're probably saying, hey Dave, come on, just tell me, should I buy Bitcoin or should I not buy Bitcoin? But man, I wanna tell you something. <laughs> That's exactly the attitude which I want to fight and I want to kind of address, which is too many people are looking for shortcuts. You know, they want people to tell them, do this or don't do this. I don't want to think. I don't want to analyze. But here's the thing. You know, if you're going to invest by just following, then like, I don't know how much potential you really have as a spectacular investor in the future. You see, in order to find the best investment deals and opportunities, you got to have some independent thinking and you got to have independent analysis and you gotta have your own framework. And you shouldn't be looking to someone to say, buy Bitcoin or don't buy Bitcoin, but rather saying, hey, what's the framework? What are the questions we need to answer? And you need to go out and you need to answer those questions. So here are some of the questions you need to answer. In terms of a value by prop popularity approach to Bitcoin, like what's your angle on that? You know, um, yeah, do you think it's, you know, actually legitimate kind of store value better than anything else. A value by kind of intrinsic value by what it's gonna generate in the future, like what's your kind of approach? What's your analysis on that? Can you see that happening? Um, overall, like the way I look at it is, I'm looking for an, an exponential increase in cryptocurrency transactions. And so I'm looking across all these cryptocurrencies and I'm trying to find where and when like the transactions just start to exponentially increase. And I think that's when we're gonna find some really, really interesting things happening in the cryptocurrency world. Right now it's kind of like, you know, there could be, you know, signs of that. Um, but a lot of the big cryptocurrencies, you don't see that exponential type of increase of transactions yet. And so that's something to be concerned about. So this is kind of my first video that's a kind of an introductory sharing on Bitcoin. And I didn't go into a lot of my more detailed thoughts on Bitcoin because I wanted to just take a step back and say, okay, how can we evaluate this, right? And how can we establish some value on Bitcoin? And that was kind of like the whole purpose of this first video. In the comments section below, I wanna ask you guys, like, what do you wanna hear about it? Is there anything else on Bitcoin or crypt cryptocurrencies that you're interested in? And I also wanna ask you to go ahead and let's make this a discussion. Go ahead and add in the comments any fantastic videos or articles or links that you've read or heard about that's really helped you kind of establish a valuation for Bitcoin, whether it's a positive or a negative one. And let's go ahead and share that in the comment section and let's get a discussion going on, on some of the best resources out there. Lastly, go ahead and subscribe to my channel, hit the like button, comment. Let's go ahead and build up this community. Let's up the bar in investing in our thinking processes and how we analyze investment opportunities. Good luck and take care.